Well, I don't care what they call themselves. They sing good. <laughs> Let's pray, folks. Father, by your grace, we sit in this place. By your grace, we open this incredibly powerful book that we know is the Bible. That you put into our hands to be read and to be shared. You've given us the spirit to illuminate it. I pray that that's the case today. That what we share here would point all hearts, all eyes, all ears directly to you. Your time and your house. And thank you for all the blessings that we get from being here. As we pray in your son's name. Amen. I have to tell you, in many ways and many times, I feel like I was born about 130 years too late. Then I think about that sometime and begin to think about what would happen back then, what did happen back then, when minor illnesses could be quite serious. I, I've never really been a fan of outhouses, and uh, I like clean water. I got an iPhone, an iPad, an iPod, all those deals. It wouldn't have been there back there. But I tell you, I do love horses. And it was a time when life was simple and when things were more focused, although there was a great deal of hardship that came with it, and a great mystique. I love reading about the Old West and thinking about the Old West. But, you know, it's obvious that change is inevitable. And change has come. Change can be good. When we look at technology that's brought a lot of different changes, much of it is good. When we look at advances in medicine and science, all these other things, they have brought changes that are good. Uh, even changes within the church, when they are biblically mandated and biblically based, can be good things. And we as believers are called to change and to grow along the way. But today I want to focus on something, make that someone who never changes who was the same yesterday, today, and forever will be exactly the same. If you want to get your Bibles and go ahead and turn to Hebrews 13, we're going to focus there today. And as you do, I want to share a bit about where we've been. Most here know that we're walking through a sermon emphasis throughout the year that's entitled The Flow of Faith. And we've begun that and looked at the definitions, the descriptions of faith, how faith works in our lives, what faith isn't. Uh, shared a lot of different things about faith. And our purpose here is to better understand God's call to faith and how we show faith, grow faith in our lives and display faith outside these doors. And as we shared last week, our greatest example of faith is found in Jesus Christ. And this morning we're going to look at the importance of those who stand in pulpits and preach the Word of God. And we're going to also look at the doctrine of the eternal nature of Jesus Christ. And so if you got your Bibles in Hebrews 13, we're going to read some verses there, but the first of those verses is verse 7. And here's what verse 7 says. It says, Remember those who rule over you, who have spoken the word of God to you, whose faith follow, considering the outcome of their conduct. Now, while you're there, I want to go back to last week for just a moment. If you turn a page back, or perhaps even on the same page, to chapter 12, Last week, we shared verses 1 and 2, and there we found this. Therefore, we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us. Let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. Now, those two verses begin with calling our attention to those who are around us and, have, who, and who have preceded us that are great examples of faith, and then it moves to the greatest example of faith, Jesus Christ. In verse 7 and in the verses we read today, we're going to see that same divine sequence as it calls our attention to those who have preceded us in faith and are great examples and then draws us to the most important example of all, and that is Jesus Christ. And we've shared as we've walked through this the context or setting of this passage. It's important to remember what it is. Written to, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, written to those who had become believers but who were surrounded by Jewish legalism. And they were surrounded by those who said, well, you know, 
the grace thing's okay, but you also have to incorporate the law. And so they had placed upon salvation and the process of becoming a Christian this encumbrance or weight that shouldn't have been there. And so the writer of Hebrews addresses that and says to them, you have to get rid of those things that have no place. And he walks through that with them. And here he continues in that as he talks about looking to those who have preceded the ones that read this, the ones that have preceded us, as examples of faith. Now notice he draws attention to those who have been leaders before, and, and implicit in that is drawing attention to those who preach the Word. And he tells us in this passage just how important preaching is, and particularly, especially, biblical preaching. He's referring here to those leaders who have died, but the spiritual principle is much broader than that. And he says to those that read this, you need to remember them. And you need to remember the faith that they displayed as you walk through your Christian life. And and I think, folks, it really tells us as well to, to be aware and cognizant of just how important sound biblical preaching is in the life of each believer. And you know, I'm not sure why, but in the last few weeks, God has just really convicted me and impressed upon me again the absolute necessity of of being faithful to his word and that whoever stands in this pulpit or any pulpit in a Christ-centered church had better find his foundation and his origin in the Bible and nowhere else. And here we're told that again in Hebrews chapter 13. You know, years ago I had an evangelist friend and he would come to visit from time to time. We'd do things together. One day we were just sitting down. He'd been an evangelist a long time. And, and this was before I was called to be a, a preacher, and we would just visit about things. And he told me one day, he said, uh, we were talking about preaching and all. He says, let me tell you something, Doug. He, he said, if, if you ever, ever get an opportunity to preach, remember that you've only got a few minutes to share that which God has given to you. Don't waste it. Let me tell you, folks, this pulpit is no place for cute sermons that are based in movies and anecdotes and the stories of life. This pulpit is a place to preach God's Word and to share God's Word. And and that's been illustrated so vividly, and I want to share a verse that Paul wrote. In 1 Corinthians 1.17, Paul said, For Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not with wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ should be made of no effect. Now, Paul understood the importance that when he got the opportunity to speak, he didn't beat around the bush, and he didn't come up with all these little cute stories out here. He got right to the heart of the matter. Let me illustrate how important that is to you. On Wednesday evenings, we gather here for prayer meeting, and and we've begun. I I share from a, a book of the Bible. We're walking through Colossians right now. And for about half of our prayer meeting time, and then the men of our church, rotate and they come forward and share devotional time and I love it because I've learned more about a lot of the men in our church as they stood right there and shared than I would ever learn any other time both the the experiences of their life and the faith that they possess so we did that Wednesday night David Williams came up here and he, he shared a devotion and David shared with us how he had been out with a friend and as they were about to part ways and go home His friend said to him, i got to ask you a question. And his friend said this, can you lose your salvation? Now, folks, that's an important question. But let me tell you what happened. David began to share with him and to open his Bible and find the notes that were in there that he had written in there and began to share verses with him from John 10 and from Hebrews and from other places and from Romans 8 and all. On February the 9th, Those of you that were here heard a sermon entitled, Can You Lose Your Salvation? Now you see, being in this place and listening means that God gives to us and prepares us for that which is going to come into our lives. Jesus told his disciples, guys, don't worry about it when they bring you in front of the rulers and the synagogue because in that very moment, the Holy Spirit will tell you what to say. Well, let me clear it up for you. If you think you can stay at home and that works, it don't. 
You got to hear God's word. You got to listen to God's word. Now, that, that's not a credit necessarily to the preacher. What that is is a credit to the power of God's word and the promise that the Holy Spirit is going to speak through what we've learned. And so, here, as he talks about the importance of preaching, we have to understand that it has tremendous application in the life of everyone who comes here. His ability to, to share those verses with that is is a credit to what we find in God's Word. And I, I think back to what Paul said in 1 Corinthians 9, 16. He says, For if I preach the gospel, I have nothing to boast of, for necessity is laid upon me. Yes, woe is me if I do not preach the gospel. I, I'll tell you bluntly, I can't imagine a pastor or preacher who'd stand in this pulpit and go home afterwards and go, Oops, forgot to tell them about the gospel. I mean, that's the heart of what we do. It's the heart of what's being shared right here. And as Paul writes to these who are being surrounded by others who say, oh, wait a minute, you've got to have all this other stuff. He says, no, you don't. Look back to those that preach to you and the ones who preach sound biblical doctrine to you and gave you the words of God and claim those and live by those. You see, we need to be attentive to what's shared from God's Word in this pulpit on Sunday morning. By the way, we do it on Sunday nights. By the way, we do it on Wednesday night. By the way, we do it on Thursday night. And probably a lot of other times as well. And what must be at the heart of the message that are shared by the preachers and the leaders that are mentioned here and the ones that you listen to? Well, it's the eternal, unchanging nature of Jesus Christ. Look at verse 8 of Hebrews 13. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, today and forever. Now, let me tell you, folks, you know this. You can go through Scripture, and there's verses that, you know, kind of fill in, and there's verses that are part of an account and a story and all of this. And then there's certain verses that, that are unto themselves doctrine. Hebrews 13.8 is 100% doctrine. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Now, what are we saying here? If, if you look at this to those to whom it was written, verse 8 is kind of a transitional statement that moves from verse 7 that says, look back to those that preach to you, which we're going to read in a minute, that says, watch out for those who are coming in and giving you false doctrine. But by itself, it is incredibly important to the life and the doctrinal basis and foundation of every single believer. And when you look at the Greek, here's what it literally says. It says, Jesus Christ, yesterday and today the same, and unto the ages forever. Now, what does that mean? Well, the first thing it means is that Jesus Christ is eternal. In John 1, it says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. That, that's the yesterday, folks. Now, if you want to have fun, try to figure that out. Because it really wasn't the beginning it's always been. Now, everything that you and I do has a point that we begin and a point that we end. Not so with God, not so with Jesus, not so with the Holy Spirit. Always been. Jesus didn't come into being in a manger. It wasn't his incarnation in which he suddenly was. He's always been. Active in creation. Active in the Old Testament. Shared with us in the New Testament. He has always been eternal and divine. Secondly, it tells us that Jesus is the same today. Now, what does that mean to you and me? It means when you and I open this book and we read the accounts of Jesus in here, what we read about Jesus, his nature, his actions, his response, everything about him that we read in here is exactly the same today. Nothing changes. The heart that we see in this book, the plan and purpose that we see in this book, Everything remains exactly the same. Which, by the way, let me fill you in, so do his commands, okay? We may like some of that other stuff and go, well, I don't really like that command. That's probably changed. No, it hadn't. The same expectations of us, the same desires for us. And it tells us, lastly, that he will forever remain the same. Now, Scripture tells us that he's at the right hand of his Father right now. But if you go to the end of this book, here's what it says. He's coming back. He's coming back exalted. He's coming back triumphant. 
And the one who came before is the one who is now and will come back and be exactly the same. And, and, I, and I think about that and how he exemplifies that and tells us that. And, and I have to share with you, you know, one of my favorite passages in all of scriptures in John 13, the night before Jesus' death. And, and he's there with his disciples and, and he washes their feet. And when I, every time I imagine that and see that, I think of being able to look into the eyes of Jesus as he washes those disciples' feet and seeing all of his nature right there captured as he did that. Now, Jesus is not going to wash my feet. i got to tell you, when I get up there, I hope I can do his. But, but they got to see that and sense that, and we're told here explicitly that that's who he is, and his eternal nature is going to be there for us. If you look back at Hebrews 1, there's two or three verses there that really lay that out in such a beautiful and vivid way. I want to share them with you. In Hebrews 1, verses 10 through 12, it says, And you, Lord, in the beginning laid the foundation of the earth, and the heavens are the work of your hands. They will perish, but you remain, and they will all grow old like a garment, and like a cloak you will fold them up. They will be changed, but you are the same and your years will not fail. Folks, that's just not a doctrinal statement about Jesus Christ. That's a battle cry for the believer. That's what we hold high. That's what we hold dear. That's what we proclaim to the world and show to the world in everything that we do. It's an ever-constant reminder to be on guard against everything and everyone who tries to lessen it. It was happening then. It happens today. Look at Hebrews 13, 9. Do not be carried about with various and strange doctrines, for it's good that the heart be established by grace, not with foods which have not profited those who have been occupied with them. So here's what we're told. One, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. That's a doctrine. Here's the warning. Watch out for anybody who tries to lessen that, diminish that, or change that. You might recall in our Wednesday nights, if you're part of that, that as we've walked through, and in Colossians, Paul talks about being called as a minister and his role as a minister, and he shares in that. And I shared about that. And one of the verses that really is at the heart of the call of the pastor and the responsibilities of the pastor is Acts 20, 28. And it, and it says there, Therefore take heed to yourselves and to all the flock among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers, to shepherd the church of God which he purchased with his own blood. Now, you know, that, that's a verse that every pastor ought to keep right at the forefront of their existence and their call. When God says, I've made you steward of that which my son died for. And we read that verse, but let me, let me read to you what follows. For I know this, that after my departure, savage, savage wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. And also from among yourselves, men will rise up speaking perverse things to draw away the disciples after themselves. Repeatedly, God says, here's the standard. Make sure you don't let anybody, any time, change that, try to change it, or lessen it. And there's this great and divine sequence that we find there, a call to faith and the standard for an unchanging faith and the warning of what others will try to do. And you may ask yourselves, well, does that still happen today? Let me tell you what, friends. Those who preach a Jesus who promises prosperity and no hardship are not in God's Word. Those who want to make you believe that every day can be Friday and every moment filled with happiness are sowing false doctrine. And those who want you to believe that every road leads to heaven and we can embrace, we can embrace everyone's belief as equal are totally non-biblical. Every sermon that avoids the Bible or neglects to expound the words of God has to be avoided. And so what are we to do? Every church needs to make sure that they've got pastors and leaders whose complete loyalty and faith is in a Jesus Christ who was the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. 
There is an absolute necessity for allegiance to the Word of God and the nature of Jesus Christ that's revealed in it. And every single believer better make sure that you anchor yourselves in Hebrews 13, 8. We live in a world that changes by the moment. By the moment. And you and I change, hopefully in our growth to Christ-likeness. Being Christ-like remains our standard for who we are. But the Jesus Christ who is eternal and the Jesus Christ revealed in the Bible and the Jesus Christ who will return triumphant and exalted is the Jesus Christ that has to fill our hearts and rule our lives. And I want to share a verse with you as we near the end here that really puts that within us and reminds us of what we must do. It's a great verse, 1 Corinthians 15, 58. And it says, Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast and movable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. That's an absolute, folks. You move from the absolute of Jesus' nature being the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow to the absolute of God calling us to be steadfast and immovable and always abound in the work of the Lord. And when we put it in the context of faith, our faith is placed in one who never, ever changes. There's one standard for all of us, one and only one who never changes, one and only one who's the weight of the Father, and it's where our faith must be placed. And faith placed elsewhere is misplaced and ineffective. As we draw to a close, in Ephesians 2, we're told that the love and grace in which salvation originates is that which we must accept in faith. A great lesson there for all of us in rem reminding ourselves or perhaps becoming aware of the fact that we didn't originate this. We didn't come up with the means to be reconciled to the Father. He did it. He did everything necessary to place it before us, and in doing that, he said, your response must be one of faith. And it's not a simple nod of the head, and it's not a simple thing that, that that sounds good. It is a total submission that says, in my belief, I'm giving you my life. You got it. Every bit of it. Now, folks, I want to tell you something. We're going to have an invitation in a minute. But I don't want you to start thinking about what you're going to eat for lunch. And I don't want you to start thinking about the activities of the afternoon because I want to tell you a little something. When that invitation is over, we got four young people that are about to be baptized. And they are going to be a visible representation of everything that we share from this pulpit. How God has offered to them a changed life. How they've accepted in faith and now they publicly display it and profess it to all of us. I want you to know if you're in this place today, and you haven't taken that step in faith that God says this is your time. The time to open your heart and to understand that that which separates you from God can never be removed except through the blood of Jesus Christ. But his love is so great that he says I will give it to you if you will believe, completely believe in the life, death, and resurrection of my son Jesus Christ. Your life will be changed, folks. But let me tell you a little something else. Your eternity will be changed. It'll be yours forever. Our invitation is the time to come forward and to share the decisions that God's laid on the heart, whatever it might be. Well, let's pray before we do that. Bow with me.